thank you. And I too want to thank you for coming out in this godforsaken cold night. <laughs> well, um, this is my, uh, after being in the sport for 50 some years, I would have to say to you that this is really my favorite subject. Um, and I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible, but always with a covenant. My students hear this at every class. Baseball is a social institution. Make no mistake about it. It is a social institution with very important social responsibilities. Now, like any social institution, we've had our ups and downs. I don't want to stand here tonight and tell you that this has been a perfect situation. But I'm very proud of our heritage. I'm very proud of what we've done. I know the subject matter tonight um, starts the talk of integration. And let me give you our history. Um, it's my first lecture in all th at all three universities. I had the privilege of having Sharon Robinson, Jackie's daughter, work for me for almost 25 years. His widow, Rachel, who was one of the most remarkable women I've ever known. Um, and I have become extremely friendly. And let's think about this. Baseball mirrors American society. And so, in 1945, there had not been any black players in the game. Oh, back in the 19th century, one or two for a year or so. But. And a man by the name of Branch Rickey, then president of the Brooklyn Dodgers, I think, in my opinion, the greatest sports executive of all time, for a myriad of reasons, but certainly none bigger than this, decided after a vote, think about it, 16 owners, there were 16 teams in those days, voted 15 to 1 not to allow a black player in baseball. Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was the first commissioner, hired, he was a federal judge in 1921 because of the Black Sox scandal, which to his everlasting credit, he did, he really cleaned up. The fact that uh, I believe that Babe Ruth is the guy who really rescued baseball in the 20s and 30s is a whole other story. But Landis, um, I say this with some trepidation, um, was not going to allow a black player while he was the commissioner um, and didn't. Mercifully, he died in 1945. <laughs> and um, I say that with all due respect, which, which means I don't say it, which means I don't say it with all due respect. <laughs> Mr. Uh, the next commissioner, the second commissioner, was Albert Happy Chandler, a senator from Kentucky, of all places. And one wouldn't think that senator would be open to this, but Branch Rickey, and it's a wonderful story that I, I won't take all the time to tell you all its ramifications, but there are a lot of them. And it's really one of the great stories in American history, particularly in the 20th century. I've gotten many his, historians to agree with me that Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson are two of the most important people in America in the 20th century. But Rickey, began to scout the Negro Leagues. For those of you who don't remember, there were Negro League teams all over, quite successful in their own way, played in major league ballparks, but obviously they were just, they were all Negroes, great players. One of the great tragedies in all of this is the wonderful players 
of that time, there was a catcher by the name of Josh Gibson. Leon, you remember Josh Gibson. I know that. I, I remember that. Um, he doesn't even know who the hell Josh Gibson is, but I, I just wanted to tell him that anyway. But um, <laughs> great player. And players like DiMaggio, Williams, Bob Feller, great players of that era, all said, what a great player he is. He should be in the major leagues. But, and so Branch Rickey, who remains, I think, the greatest sports executive of all time, but sent his scouts, and not telling anybody, including his own scouts, he told them he was scouting players for the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers. But he wasn't. He was scouting them for the famed Brooklyn Dodgers. And after, I won't go into a lot of detail, but after a considerable amount of time, it's a wonderful story, he, um, he had a great scout named Clyde Sukaforth, tremendous scout. Discovered a lot of great players. And he sent Suki, as he called him, to Kansas City. Jackie was playing for the Kansas City Monarchs. And um, Sukaforth said to Jackie one day, I'm here scouting for the Dodgers, and tell them white Dodgers or black Dodgers, and uh, Mr. Ricky would like to see you. This is after a lot of work. Now Robinson, for those of you who don't know, was a very interesting man. He had been an All-American football player at UCLA. All-American track star, played basketball, and um, had gone into service, had been court-martialed, because he wouldn't go to the back of the, bu uh, of the bus. And if you knew Jackie Robinson, you can understand why he wouldn't go to the back of the bus. Fortunately, he won the court-martial, and um, left, and then was playing, he was actually playing shortstop. I don't want to get into all the baseball terms, but he didn't have a shortstop's arm. But that didn't matter to Brand Tricky. So Sukaforth brought him to Brooklyn. 215 Montague Street, that was the Dodger office, fam very famous office. And there was Jackie Robinson with Brand Tricky. Jackie had no idea why he was there. He called his, his fiance, who became his wife, and who, as I said, I'll get into a little more as we go on, was a pillar of strength. In my opinion, Jackie doesn't make, make it except for his wife. But um, after some conversation, Mr. Ricky, who was eloquent and a great actor, um, said to him, told him why I was there. Jackie was stunned. Stunned. Um, and Branch Rickey asked him the essential question. For the first two years, he said to him, will you take it and turn the cheek? You can't fight back. Ricky was doing the right thing, tough as that was. Now, I have to remember Jackie was a very aggressive athlete, human being. And he said he would, and he did, painful as it was. In October of that year, they announced that the Montreal Royals, who were the AAA farm club of the Dodgers, signed Jackie. Very smart on Ricky's part. AAA club sent him to Montreal, which was, as Rachel has often told me, a wonderful place for a black player to play. They loved him there, and he loved them. And so, um, the first game that he played was in Jersey City in 1946. Thank you very much. And threw it his head. He had two home runs that day. He had a fabulous year in 1946. So great that they won the World, Little World Series, played Syracuse. And, um, there was a great line. 
when they won the Little World Series, Jackie was, uh, was walking down the streets of Montreal, and there were a huge group of white people chasing him. And everybody said that's the only time a black man got chased which, where it was a great thing, and it was. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> this historic moment, now, now understand what Ricky did. I want you to understand what he did. Three and a half years before Harry Truman desegregated the United States Army, seven years before Brown versus Board of Education decision, and 18 years before the Civil Rights Movement. And here's Jackie Robinson. They went to spring training and they went to Havana, Cuba, where he could go in those days, obviously, because uh, Branch Rickey was very concerned that Jackie have a good spring training. <coughs> The Dodger players were objecting, objecting strenuously, most of the veteran players. And uh, they would march into Ricky's office, and, or the manager was Leo DeRocher. I don't know how many of you remember Leo DeRocher. <laughs> Leo the Lip, yeah, he was everything they said he was. On this issue, though, he was good. Leo said, had a team meeting, and I, I won't repeat all the profanities, although I'm, I'm inclined to do that, so I may do it before the night is over. <laughs> but he said he's going to play, and, he, and he's going to play for us. If you don't like it, get the word starts with an F uh, <laughs> out of here. And Leo was tough, and Jackie loved him. Unfortunately, uh, life is always complicated. Um, the commissioner in, at the end of spring training had gotten word that Leo did what you're not supposed to do. He was consorting with gamblers in Havana. And of course that's a no-no then and it's a no-no now. Now, Happy said that the CYO in Brooklyn was objecting to a man of this, of his ilk being a manager, and he, he had 20 more years of manager, but he got suspended. Now, the real reason he got suspended, I, I would tell you, it's not often written. Leo was in a torrid affair with an actress, you will all remember, by the name of Lorraine Day. And uh, that's really what the CYO didn't like. So Leo got suspended. And uh, there was a manager that uh, Branch Rickey had, a man by the name of Bert Schotten, who sat in a coat and a tie, and it was a really strange, but he became the manager. Now, I said to you, the players objected. That's why this is a manifestation of society. This is exactly the type of things that one will go through. They objected, and um, there was a right fielder by the name of Dixie Walker very, very famous player, and a great player, called the People's Choice from church in Brooklyn, but he was a wonderful player. And, um, I mean, really a good player. And he walked into Ricky's office and said, I'm not taking a shower with any black guy. That's what he told Ricky. Ricky said, fine, he's gonna be here, Dixie. And um, a couple days later, he got traded to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Well, getting traded to Pittsburgh was like, well, it was bad. Pittsburgh, could, <laughs> Pittsburgh couldn't beat a team managed by my Aunt Fanny, and I did have an Aunt Fanny, by the way. <laughs> and um, that was Dixie. Now, I'll tell you a follow-up to the story. I digress a minute because the anecdotes are interesting. Now it's 17 years later, and Dixie Walker is the hitting instructor of the Milwaukee Braves. And I'm out for dinner one night with um, a group of four people, all Southerners, and the gen uh, not the general manager, but the farm director, the scouting director, player development, and a couple of the coaches, whom I liked a lot, by the way, who taught me a lot of baseball over the years. When I was 30 years old at the time, I don't know how I had the guts to do this. I have no idea. 
But in the middle of dinner, I said to Dixie, who I didn't really know that well, getting to know him, Dixie, are you, have you ever had been embarrassed by what happened with Jackie Robinson? Now, why would I do such a thing? <laughs> he was wonderful. He said, I have. And he said, I'll tell you what I did with Jackie. Years later, I wrote him a letter. And I, he was a hitting instructor, I think, at that time with the Cardinals. And he said, I'm going to get to New York. I'd like to sit down. Jackie wrote back, said he'd like to. I asked Rachel, I told Rachel Robinson the story years later, and she says, absolutely true. And Dixie then said to me that night, you know, bud, I'm a kid from Birmingham, Alabama. We have a large hardware store. I never had a deal with a black. They never around in school. They're different schools, different everything. And I was wrong. He then proudly told me about my friend Henry Aaron, and, and, and he was the greatest hitter he ever saw, which I agree. And so what I say to you, and I stories all night, baseball is a social institution, that's what it is. It is a social institution. Jackie comes to the big leagues April 15, 1947, Ebbetsfield, Brooklyn. And I've talked to a lot of people in Brooklyn at the time, and it became a bigger deal later on. It was big, it was huge. Lots of problems the first year, horrible problems. He got to um, Philadelphia, which may have been the worst of all the places, <clears throat> and it was awful. There was a manager, for those of you who saw 42, the movie about Jackie, Ben Chapman. Ben Chapman was brutal, brutal lousy, rotten manager. Besides, he got fired in 48 and never got a job again. So, <laughs> But he was he really rode Robinson. Jackie got to St. Louis, and um, they were going to strike. And they were told by the National League President, Ford Frick, who later became the commissioner, much to Ford's everlasting credit, that um, if they struck, they'd be suspended. Cardinals took a vote led by the great Stan Musial, who was a great human being to begin with, but when you hear that story, he's even a greater human being. And they decided not to stay. Went to Cincinnati, which you can imagine was, was, and he was taking an awful pounding. And that's where something happened that is remarkable. Pee Wee Reese. For those of you who remember the Dodgers news, it was a great shortstop. Kid from Louisville, Kentucky. Think about that. He's from Louisville, Kentucky. And in the midst of pregame warm-up where the fans were really on Jackie and the things they were saying, Pee Wee went over, put his arm around Jackie. Now remember, here's a kid from Louisville. Cincinnati is close by, so many have said, including Jackie and Rachel, Boy, you were taking a chance. My goodness, your hometown. He didn't care. So for every Dixie Walker situation, there's a Pee Wee Reese situation. And the story gets better. He has a great year. Dodgers win the pennant, lose the World Series to the Yankees. In 48, plays brilliantly. But the tension, the pressure is unbelievable. Enos Country Slaughter is an outfielder for the Cardinals. Jackie was playing first base. Slaughter came down the line, spikes high, trying to hit him, tear his Achilles tendon. Jackie went down like he was shot, but fortunately he recovered. And it was so when I tell you it was tough, Rachel has said to me on multiple occasions, because I've peppered her with questions for the last 20 years, he probably was close to having a nervous breakdown at the end of the 48 season. Because remember, he knew, he knew that if he failed for that generation, 
there'll be no more black players. He knew it. Ricky knew it. There were other black players being signed, but this was this was, was the key. And Henry Aaron has often said to me about this, word for Jackie, there'd be no Henry Aaron, no more, no Willie Mays, no Bob Gibson. Think about that. And he knew it. After 48, Ricky took the handcuffs off him, which was only fair. And Jackie became a very aggressive player, often criticized, arrogant, this and that, and so on and so forth. Well, everybody's entitled to their own view. But he, he began to defend himself. But I look back in a story as I thought about integration. And it is an amazing story, even in a retrospect of 60 years later. In 1997, I was already thinking, it's going to be 50 years, how do we honor Jackie? Didn't know how to do it. Thought about it. Len Coleman, who was an African American, was president of the National League. And I worked with him, and he was very good. And he said to me one day, I'm going to ask you about something. You won't do it. I always like that when somebody tells you, but you won't do it. Well, why don't you ask me? Let's find out if I'll do it. But you said you want to do something big. I said, yeah. Because it is, and I want to say this to you, I say it often, the most powerful and important moment in baseball history. There is nothing else close to it. Yeah, Babe Ruth did this, and Joe DiMaggio did this, and that, that and they're all great moments, but there was nothing like this. So, we finally decided we were going to retire his number, 42, in perpetuity. Every ballpark today has 42 up there. And when I look at it, I, it, it, I realize how important it was. Now, We've designated April 15th, you remember that's the date in Ebbets Field that he started. The Dodgers chose to wear 42 on April 15th, all the players. It was about eight or nine years later, I'd come home from Phoenix on a Sunday, which is usual, and the phone is ringing. I always tell the story, but it's true. I figured it's some owner who lost a game who's mad about something, and I don't want to listen to all that stuff on <laughs> nine o'clock on Sunday night. But it wasn't. It was Ken Griffey Jr., certainly the greatest player, I think, of his generation. Wonderful young man. Commissioner, can I bother you? I mean, we, had, you know, we were friends, and he said, I, I got an idea. I hope you'll, well, let's hear it, Ken. He said, why can only the Dodgers wear 42? You know, some of the young guys don't even know who Jackie Robinson is, young African-American player. Why can't everybody on April 15th wear 42? Well, you know, I'm very cautious and I always take my time and I said, let me think about it overnight. I knew damn well we were going to do it. <laughs> and we talked for a little, a little baseball for a while and I said, Ken, I'll call you in the morning. I did and we did it. And he gets credit and whenever I see him, he always thanks me for telling But it's, a, it's absolutely true. And so, my social institution theory is something I believe in deeply. I love the game, proud of the game, but I'm more proud of what I've seen it do. And Rachel Robinson asked me a story one day, this is five or ten years, she came here for my statue there. She actually came here three or four times. And we had, she and I had lunch and she said, I want to ask you a question. How did you get to this point of where you are. I said, well, you know, I don't know. I, I said, no, let me tell you a story. And I'll tell you a story as Milwaukee Woods. It's September 23rd, 1957. I'm a history major, so you can tell I, I do remember days, names, <laughs> dates, and places. And I'm out of the service, out of college. 
and um, the Braves are going to play the St. Louis Cardinals. And if they win that night, they win the National League pennant. Now, my father convinced me I should take an accounting course. Now, I hope there are no accountants here because I had that. And my mother was a teacher, so I never, I was one of those nerds, I never skipped class. I hated accounting, I hate it to this day, I hated everything about it. And I'm driving down the freeway and I'm saying to myself, you can't go to that idiot, of course, you, the, this is the biggest game of the year. And drove off, parked eight miles away, they had obstructed view seats in the upper deck. It was obstructed, I sat right behind a post, so they at least sold it honestly. And. Um, <laughs> It was a great ball game. Cardinals were a wonderful team. And the Braves were the Braves. They were really good. In the 11th inning, the Braves had had the bases loaded in the ninth, and my friend Frank Torrey was up hitting a double play. To the day he died, I never let him forget that. <laughs> but in the 11th inning, Hank Aaron hit a home run off of their great relief pitcher, Billy Muffet, to win the game. And Bedlam ballpark and the emotion. And I have the paper the next day in the New York Times, juxtaposed against each other, both papers. Picture of Hank Aaron, the great Hank Aaron, being carried off the field by his white teammates. And Governor Orville Faubus of Arkansas spraying black kids who were merely trying to go to high school. And there they were, the two pictures. And I said to myself that day, wow, this is remarkable. I, I, I've talked about it so much that the New York Times, through Tom Werner of the Boston Red Sox, got him to gold embossed picture of that front page. And I proudly have it in my office. And I guess that's where I, you began to understand the social significance of what to do and what it means. I had one story I have to tell you. In 1947, I forget this and I, Jackie made his first appearance in Wrigley Field, Chicago. And uh, somehow we had gotten two tickets. And I had a cousin who was a professor at the University of Chicago. And my dad called him and said, there are three tickets, because we had one for him. He didn't care about baseball, but my dad said, you pick the boys up. Herb Cole and I went down to Chicago. And I can remember two things about that day. We're sitting in the upper deck. This park is jammed. Oh, there's thousands of people outside who couldn't get in. And I looked around. We were the only white people on the upper deck. My cousin, who didn't want to be there, and Herb and I. And the excitement level was unbelievable. And so, there's no question that baseball, and as I said, I, I don't want to stand here today and tell you that we've been perfect, because we certainly have not. But I'm proud of what we've done. And that changed America. Martin Luther King, years later, talked about it. It's an amazing story, a remarkable story. And so, along came Aaron, Mays, Gibson. And it was tremendous. And now there's a lot of conversation about these teams didn't sign black players, and these teams didn't. The teams that didn't sign them got killed. See, so should have. Branch Rickey had a great line. Dick Young, who was a very acerbic New York writer, had opinions on every subject. Eh, not different from a lot of people in the press today, but that's another story. But said to in 1950 or 51, I'm not quite certain of the year. What the hell are you doing? Like you said, what's the matter? Dodgers played a day game. You, you got an all-black team out in the field. And Ricky had the most appropriate answer in sports as in life. I'm here because I'm paid to win. That's my best team. And so 
Um, that set off, I think, a great integration. Could we, have, could we do better now? You bet. I said, we're not perfect. Years ago, I became concerned. You know, when Jackie died, Jackie died of diabetes, 1972, 53 years old, terrible story. He was at the World Series, Bowie Kuhn, then commissioner, had him at doom. And Bowie said, Jackie, it's great to have you here. Jackie looked over in the third base dugout and said, it'll be better, commissioner, when I look over there and see a manager, coaches. Well, we've worked hard at that. We are di more diversified than ever before. We're 40 percent minority, 28 or 9 percent of that is Hispanic, Asian and American. Our African American group is about 8 or 9 percent now, but can it get better? And I know there's been lots of conversation. And I've spent 35, 40 years trying to figure that out. If Henry Aaron were here tonight, he would tell you, he and I maybe have had a thousand conversations. And I had Frank Robinson, great player, talk about aggressive players. He was as aggressive as Jackie, great player, Hall of Fame player. He worked for me for the last 12 years I was commissioner, running this type of thing. And we've worked hard, and I think you're going to find the fruits of that will, will get better as time goes on. Uh, you can see it coming already. But I guess what I, and then we've had, today we have five general managers and four or five field managers, lots of people in front offices. Richard Lapchick, whose, whose father was the very famous Joe Lapchick, a great basketball player, runs um, Northeastern University. He grades, us every, he grades us and everybody in sports on diversity every year. Now, my mother wouldn't have liked the early grades because she didn't believe in anything other than an A, but uh, we didn't get an A. <laughs> but near the end, my last year, he wrote something that I will always be grateful. He said, I made the front offices look like America. And that's the best compliment he could pay me. And in 1999, because clubs were not doing what they were supposed to, we put in what's called the Selig Rule to this day. And that is you must interview a minority for manager, general manager, scouting director, player development director, there's about five positions. Now, I would never have the temerity to tell people what to do. Because if I said, you've got to hire so-and-so, and he flopped, I mean, you know, then they, they're left with it. But I wanted him to, they had to interview a minority. And I think it's working out well. I know football's had some problems with it, but I'm not going to get into football problem. They have enough of their own right now. Um, so that I, I, I'm quite satisfied we're on the right track. But it's tough. And clubs are not resistant to change because of bias, but just because I haven't done it that way before. But as I say, we, we, we have broken barriers. Another thing we've done, we've built academies. Academies in Compton, California. Anybody know Compton, California? It's a brutal area. Big academy. Philadelphia, Houston, Cincinnati, Washington, Miami, all in inner cities, all stressing baseball but more important, education. And these have worked wonderfully well. So what I, what I would say to you is that um, for the subject and topic you have, I could talk about this all night. I'm satisfied that we've lived up to our social institution responsibility, not as well as I'd like. Let me make a point to you about that, but good. And I think if Jackie, I know how Rachel and Sharon, Sharon his daughter, feel, I think if Jackie came back today, he'd say, it did okay. 
So, you talk about, I, I was going over a list of Jewish players, because you have anti-Semitism, obviously. Uh, Barney Dreyfus was an early owner of the Pittsburgh Pirates. The great Hank Greenberg played in Detroit from 1934 to 41. Detroit was, for those of you who remember, a tough city. And he took a lot of abuse. Al Rosen played for Cleveland, and I, Al Rosen and I became very close friends, and a lot of anti-Semitism. Al was different than Hank. Hank took it. Al was a fighter. You said something in his fist, it was probably in your teeth. Um, and so, but again on the social institution theory, you know what a hero Hank Greenberg was to every Jew? Al Rosen, and then in the 60s, the great Sandy Koufax. And I, I've gotten to know Sandy Koufax very well, but whether he's religious or not is not important. He wouldn't pitch on Yom Kippur. And so I could stand here all night and give you more examples of my social institution theory in a myriad of ways. But there's no question that it, it's there, and I'm proud of it. Well, on that note, I, I'm delighted. This has been a wonderful experience. I've enjoyed it, and thank, thank you very much.